Uh, so, hi, my name is Stefan Jonsson. I'm speaking to you from uh, Sweden, a city called Norrköping in Sweden, where I work as a professor and writer. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, talk to you about my uh, friend and colleague, Pia Arke. Uh, and uh, I'm very, also, very happy also to, to hear that her work is now shown in, in Seoul at the Sonja Art Center. And um, the curators have asked me to say a few words about Pia's uh, and mine collaboration in a project uh, that resulted in a book called uh, Stories from Scoresby Sund. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this book and, and about Pia's work in general. And um, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures. So I will start to share these pictures now. And I will begin here. I think this uh, is one of Pia Arke's most disseminated and spread images, which was taken with a pinhole camera at the southern tip of Greenland, a big island in the North Atlantic and part of the Arctic region of the world. Uh, I know also that this picture is shown at the Sony Art Center in Seoul, uh, together with some other images. Uh, this is Pierre when she transposed herself uh, through her photographic technique over this landscape uh, that she took with the pinhole camera. And to the left of her uh, is one of her friends. She interrogated in her art her relationship to this landscape and to the people who live there, which also means that she interrogated her own past because she was born in, in this landscape and, and grew up uh, as a child there. Piarke's work <coughs> She started to make art in the 1980s and um, for Europeans and, and Danes in Denmark, where she spent her adult life, her work reminded um, us, the Europeans, of a history that uh, we never got to know or were taught not to know because it happened overseas. Her work began to be shown and discussed at the beginning of the 1990s. This was a period when notions of globalization offered new models for understanding the dynamics of the world. And um, a lot of neglected, neglected histories and aesthetic issues came to the forefront. Among the most important of these issues were the colonial legacies of West European states. And it was in this context that Pia's interrogations of the suppressed past of Denmark's relationship to Greenland began to resonate. And her work came to be seen as one among several other explorations of, of colonial legacies and the, and the, and the children and the, and the inheritors of that legacy. Pia was the daughter of an Inuit woman who worked as a seamstress and a Danish man who was in Greenland to build telegraph lines she was born in 1958 and she was born in a place called Skorespi Sund or in Greenlandic Itorkortormit, uh, which is Denmark's 
most remote and outermost settlement in Northeast Greenland. She was, from her birth, she was entangled in imperial processes, which endowed her with a kind of split vision and multiple identities. And these are the qualities that animated her artistic research and her art projects already from the beginning when she studied at Copenhagen's Royal Academy of Fine Arts. And all the way until she died in 2007, very early and much too early from cancer at the age of 1948, when she was just standing at the threshold of gaining the international recognition that she deserves and which her work is now getting throughout the world. I make the history of colonialism part of my history, Pierre said. I make it part of my history in the only way I know, namely by taking it personally. This is what she wrote in her book, Sund, the stories from Skorisby Sund photography, coloniza colonization, and mapping, which she completed in 2003. Taking history personally, for Pia, it meant quietly asserting the life story that was hers as an aesthetic vantage point for viewing the past and the present with a decolonial gaze. This is the cover of the book in its, in its Danish original. And here is the cover of the English and Greenlandic translation of this book. I had the privilege to follow Pia's work already from the beginning of the 1990s. And we started a long and winding conversation, which led to a few collaborative projects. And I think this book was one of the most, well, it was the most important. Uh, my position was that of a critic and writer interested in the afterlives of colonialism in European culture. And for me, when I uh, got to know Pia Arke, her visual universe was a kind of revelation um, in unpredictable ways and in very personal ways. Her work embodied and enriched the theoretical discourse of the period, its notions of hybridity, metissage, third space subjectivities and subalternity. Ideas which are all at the forefront, not only of Pia Arke, but also of the th three other artists that are shown at the Sonja Art Center. So I will talk a little bit more in depth now about this project, Stories from Skorisby Sund, in which I was involved uh, together with Pia. Uh, we did, uh, she did most of the work on the book, but we did the book together. Uh, in this book, as I mentioned, she set herself the task to reclaim her personal history, to take back her history. But in order to take back her history, she first had to discover how it came that she was robbed and deprived of it. And this involved immediately that she had to enter into close combat with world politics. So therefore this book is as much a personal 
as a political book. But first and foremost, it is a book filled with wonder and humor and love for a people living at the world's fringes, or rather living at a spot that the Europeans placed at the world's fringes. This is the original plan that uh, Pia made for this project. It's a survey map. You can read words of the places, Skorespisund, and below that, Ittukorturmit. It's a Greenlandic word that means where the big houses are. This was the place where Pia Arke was born in 1958. And she wanted to recover her own personal history and the history of this place. It was populated in 1925. It didn't exist until 1925, when it was populated by 14 families who were brought from another small from a, from a small village south of there. Amasalik is the name of that village. So from there in 1925, 14 families were brought to this remote unpopulated place in East Greenland. And I should also mention that East Greenland <coughs> It's a much harsher place uh, than West Greenland, where most of the population lives. Uh, this is because of the ocean streams, where the warm streams flow from the south to the north on the western side of Greenland, but on the eastern side, where Skorspisund, Itukortormit, and Amasalik are located the ocean streams for, flow from the north to the south. So therefore, they, the, the ocean is frozen throughout the year, except for the month of July and half of August. Pia wanted to recover her history. Uh, because among the families who were brought to Amasalik were her, her maternal grandparents. So the grandparents were brought there. Her mother was born there. Her mother met a Danish telegraph en engineer, and then she herself was brought, born there. This is what the place looks like today. This is a picture from in the summer, in August. Here we have a picture in the spring, probably in June or so. And here is another picture from the spring. Uh, it was Pia's dream to represent the founding of this settlement in a way that was loyal to the perspective of the people who actually moved there. In this image, you can see uh, most of the people who moved there in 1925. They are standing on a boat which traveled from Amasalik to Iceland and then to Skorespisund. In Skorespisund, sorry, in Skorespisund, they moved into houses which had been built there for them the summer before. But this story about this settlement does not just concern the people who live there today and the people who came there in 1925, 
the history of this small village is it reflects a larger history of Danish colonialism headquartered in Copenhagen and incorporated into this history is also the histories of scientific disciplines such as geology and paleontology, ethnography, cartography, meteorology and so-called eschimology because all of these scientific disciplines have used Skorisbysund, this village, as a kind of operational base. And furthermore, this village played a very important role and the settlement of the village played a very important role in a geopolitical political conflict between Denmark and Norway where both the both two countries they claimed sovereignty over this part of Greenland and so the the idea with Denmark moving this family to Skorisbysund was to show that Denmark did something with this territory that they moved people there that they were developing this part of Greenland and the families who moved there, of course, had to pay the price for that geopolitical uh, project of colonization. My contribution to stories from Skoris Bysund was to write an essay uh, that accompanied Pia's stories and images. And this essay showed how the geopolitical conflict played out through exploration, territorial surveying, and cartography. And basically how Skoris Bysund was placed on the world map through centuries of exploration and cartography. So here is a very, very early map from the 16th century of the Arctic region. And gradually it was possible to follow the establishment then of Skoris Bysund on the different maps that were drawn in order to fixate this place and give it a, a a position in, uh, uh, in, in the world of politics, science and geography. This is a map from the 1930s where the whole region was very detailed, very surveyed by uh, uh, Danish scientists and engineers. And the point is that these maps and these master plans of East Greenland they were designed in other places, places such as Venice, Amsterdam, Edinburgh, London, Oslo, Brussels, and Copenhagen from the 16th century and onwards. And eventually, of course, all of these maps were used to claim ownership of this territory, to claim that it was Danish or Norwegian and the maps were drawn with these purposes in mind. Denmark was eventually successful and they received through an international court decision sovereignty over this part of the world and much of this was because of this map making but it was also because these 14 families who moved to Skorisbysund to live there and to show that Denmark had some activity going on there. So none of this would have been possible without the enforced support of the East Greenlandic Inuit society. And Pia Arke, the artist who made this book together with me and who made these fantastic images, she was very much aware of herself 
as a living evidence of these histories. The project for the book originated more concretely when Pia returned to Skorespisund. She had been living there as a child from birth until she was five years old. That is between 1958 and 1964. It was only in 1997 that she then returned to Skorespisund. This was because she met a brother who lived there, a brother who she, 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 she really hadn't seen after she moved from there when she was five. In this picture, which is also in the book, you see the brother. He's called Ole Brönlund, and he's here with his dog. And she uh, got along very well with Ole and stayed there in the summer of 1997. Stayed there in her birthplace. And then <clears throat> I will read to you a letter that she wrote to me. I will stop sharing and I will read to you this letter which she wrote to me then in 1997. Uh, she describes the place of Skoris Bisund and she says that there reigns there is a state of historical embarrassment because no one really knows what the history of this place is. This lack of historical awareness, she said, manifested itself in the inhabitants' reluctance to speak about the past and about the first generation's trials and disappointments. And this lack of historical awareness was reflected not least in the fact that the community there in Greenland, they didn't have any documentation of the history. Instead, the history of this place, Pia said, was to be found outside Skorsbysund. She wrote, history has moved away and is dispersed in picture archives, scientific studies, diaries, photo albums, attics and basement rooms in Denmark, Paris, New York, Oslo and Stockholm. So the project with stories from Skoris Bysund <clears throat> was very much then to bring this history back to the place. <clears throat> Here is an example of the kind of history of the place that Pia found. This is a photo album which she found then in Copenhagen. Uh, a photo album from the village of Skorisbysund and in the pictures she found pictures of her mother, her cousins, her aunts and uncles. Pictures which she had never seen before. So she started to gather such documents. She also started to interview people, both travelers and Danish people who had visited Skorisbysund, but above all her relatives who still live in Skorisbysund. So she collected pictures, she collected stories, she collected witness histories, and eventually she brought this documentation together into a new archive, which she, the very first thing that she did was that she displayed it in the small town hall 
in the village of Skorisbysund. And after that, she wrote, uh, she, we made the book uh, Stories from Skorisbysund. Where then Pia Arke, <coughs> she told the history from below. I told the history of the place, so to speak, from above. She told it from the people who lived there and who made the history. I told it from the point of view of the, of power, of the geopolitical forces that contributed and determined uh, the history of this place. Here is one picture that Pia found. This picture is <clears throat> the six Danish um, carpenters and house builders who came in 1924. They built houses, small houses. They stayed over the winter and in 1925 the houses were there and the Greenlandic families came on the boat and moved into these houses. Here is Pia Arke's grandmother, Katinka Arke. So Pia also did the work of identifying all the individuals who moved there, including her own grandparents. Here is another <coughs> picture that she found. This is again her grandmother and her gra the grandmother's sister. And then one of her aunts in the middle, the child. You see this picture is from August 1926, when the families have lived in Skorisbysun for one year. This is outside the same house. This is inside the house and this is outside. Here are the people who live inside that house. Um, you see again Katinka here. The second woman standing from the left, the grandmother. You also see a man up here called Einar Mikkelsen, the man who is not Inuit, but who is really the person who was the Danish mastermind and the governor of the place Skorisbysund. The man who really had the fate of these families in her hands and who decided that this colony should be founded together with other Danish colonial officials. <clears throat> this is another picture that Pia Arke found in European archives. This is a picture from the British newspaper, The Times. The picture is taken in 1932. The picture shows, again, Pia Arke's grandparents, her mother's mother and her mother's father, Niels Arke and Katinka Arke. Where did Pia Arke find this photograph? She found it in, um, in Stockholm the place, uh, the capital of Sweden, where I work, worked and lived at, at the time. I, uh, Pia Arke visited me in Stockholm. I worked at a newspaper, a major newspaper in Stockholm. We decided to go down to the newspaper archive, to the photo archive in the newspaper. Uh, and in that archive, which consists of thousands and thousands of photographs made by press photographers, 
and press photo agencies. Uh, we opened an envelope and it said on the envelope, uh, it said East Greenland popular types. And uh, we opened it and, and there Pia said, well, this is my grandmother and my grandfather. Uh, so there she found them in a photograph taken by a British press photographer who visited Skorespi Sund in the summer of 1932. And on the back of the photograph, there was a caption. And the caption said something like, two Eskimos encountered on our way back to the base. So Pia took the photograph where I told her to take it and she put it in her bag and it ended up in this book. Pia also went around and made interviews with the people who lived in Skorsby Sund in 1997 and 1998. And uh, one of the person that she, she talked to was this man, William Arke. She interviewed him. I also met him when, when I was there the summer afterwards. He lived in the senior home, the, the home for the old people in Skorsby Sund. Uh, and he was one of three or four people who still lived and who had been on that boat. In this picture from 1926, you see William here. I circled him in yellow. This is the boy in 1926, who is then the old man in 1997. And his story is also recorded in this book. And then finally, <clears throat> here is another picture which Pia found in these photo albums. This is a picture of her mother as a teenager. Uh, a picture taken also by a uh, European traveler, in this case, uh, uh, the man who then became P. Arke's father, a Danish engineer who visited Skorsby Sund to build telegraph lines, and there he, he met this young woman, who is, I think she's around 16 years old in this picture. This is also a picture that P. Arke didn't didn't know that she first discovered through the photo albums that she found elsewhere. This is the cover of an American arts magazine, which did a thematic section on Piarca's work a couple of years ago. The magazine is called After All, and it's a very important art magazine in the United States where Pia's mother then ended up on the cover of this, uh, of this art journal. These are some of the sketches for the book that PM then turned into an exhibition. Here is a large part of the book placed on the wall of the exhibition space. So this is ju just a brief description of <clears throat> how Piarke worked to bring the documentation of the place where she was born back to where that history belonged. Her main aim in this book was of course to, to um, challenge the imperial history uh, to challenge the metropolitan perspective that had determined how all of this material had been collected, how it had been exhibited. And she wanted to recollect it 
and exhibit it in a new way. So the documents which had previously presented a, the dominant version of history was now used to present the history from below from the people's perspective through their stories and witness accounts together with the, the, with the photographs. And, it's, and in this way, <clears throat> she also got to t tell all the, all the stories, stories, the myriad of narratives and witness accounts from her siblings, her cousins, her neighbors, and others, and various kinds of snapshots from Skorisbysund. And in this way, she transformed, I would say, this peripheral village, Skorisbysund, into something that we could call the center of the world and how she turned the perspectives between periphery and center around and put places in their right place again. So I think this is what I can tell you now in this time. Uh, and um, I hope what I've told you is interesting, and I hope you will find uh, opportunities to acquaint yourself more with Pierre's work. Thank you.